So in this talk, I want to reflect a bit on the theme of the kingdom of God and how the kingdom of God manifests in light of chapters 13 through 16. The first thing I want to talk about a bit is that from an earthly point of view, the bad guys won. Let's think about the goals of Jesus' opponents and how things looked for them at the end of Mark's Gospel. Chapter 14, verses 1 and 2, the Jewish authorities decided they needed to have Jesus executed. They succeeded. Pontius Pilate doesn't care much about the internal politics in Jerusalem, but he cares very much about maintaining his own power and Roman authority. That is undisturbed at the end of the Gospel of Mark. The figure of Barabbas is worth contemplating for a moment. 15.7, among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, there was a man called Barabbas. So let's think for a moment what this implies. Barabbas was living out the wrong-headed version of messiahship. In context, we can even see Barabbas as an example of a false messiah placed side by side with Jesus. He was a violent rebel. He had participated in an insurrection. He had killed people. He was in prison, and it was time for him to be executed. It's no accident that the Jewish authorities want him freed. He could ultimately be useful for their purposes. Certainly, his freedom is useful for his own purposes. So at the end of the Gospel of Mark, like I said, it looks like the bad guys won, so to speak. But it's not that simple. And it's really interesting to contemplate what Mark wrote down in his gospel in light of how history actually concretely unfolded in the wake of the death and resurrection of Jesus. Approximately four decades after the death and resurrection of Jesus, the Jews finally did revolt en masse against the Romans, and the Romans responded by destroying the temple and destroying Jerusalem in 70 AD. In chapter 13, verse 9, Jesus predicted persecutions would come. You will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear testimony before them. And the persecutions came. Over the next few centuries, sporadic local persecutions were fairly common. There were three major persecutions, though, that happened more under the direct orders of the Roman emperors. Nero's persecution in the mid-60s resulted in the deaths of St. Peter and St. Paul, among others, as he scapegoated Christians for the burning of Rome. This scapegoating is recorded not only in Christian sources, but in pagan sources as well. The Roman historian Tacitus records this. But after this, Christians were largely left alone. They weren't terribly well liked, and the religion remained illegal and a potential cause for death, but persecutions tended to be local and sporadic until the middle of the third century under the emperor Decius, who put out a command that every resident of the empire had to make a public sacrifice to the emperor, duly recorded by a magistrate who would then give them a receipt, so to speak, testifying that they had done so. That persecution was devastating. 
it ended kind of quickly in 251 when Decius died. It was renewed by Valerian in 257, although he too died soon thereafter. And the church then again had another half century or so of peace until the extremely severe persecutions under Diocletian, which ultimately came to an end by the ascension of the first Christian emperor, Constantine. In the long term, the Roman Empire, in fact, adopted Christianity. But in adopting Christianity, the Roman Empire itself was deeply and fundamentally changed. That deep and fundamental change was the acknowledgement that the emperor was no longer divine, no longer a god, but a human being accountable to the true God and capable of being called to account. One example of this was the Roman emperor Theodosius. In the year 390, there was a rather significant uh, massacre that occurred uh, apparently on his orders. Some of the details are unclear, but it was apparently on his orders. Bishop St. Ambrose of Milan called him out for this and required the emperor himself to make public penance for the sin of the massacre which the emperor did. Jesus announced that the kingdom of God was like a mustard seed. Tiny, you can't see it, but eventually it grows and becomes a great shelter. And the parable of the mustard seed was indeed fulfilled by the adoption of Christianity by the Romans. As with all prophecies, it's fulfilled in many ways, but that particular fulfillment, I think, is remarkably noteworthy. Let's contemplate for a moment the end of time because Jesus decided to talk about it. It's not easy to talk about and it's not easy to think about. So what does Jesus say? When you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away before all these things take place. This passage has historically been very challenging to interpret because it's not entirely clear who this generation is. Was he meaning for it to unfold in the lifetime of his hearers? From context, we can see that this is not the case. Again, in chapter 13, verse 10, the gospel must first be preached to all nations. That wasn't going to happen in the lifetime of his immediate hearers. A better interpretation of this generation is the generation that witnesses the ultimate signs of the end. That is, when the signs of the end are coming, the generation witnessing them will not pass away before the end comes. Once these signs begin, in other words, the end will come rapidly. A lot of crazy things have been written and said about the end times. The Catholic Church traditionally has been somewhat reticent to say anything too particular about the end. And part of why we can see right here in chapter 13, in verse 32, of that day or that hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Take heed, watch and pray, for you do not know when the time will come. Nobody knows when it's going to come. And Jesus is making clear here that, on the one hand, be watchful, but on the other hand, don't obsess yourself too much on calculating it. You don't know. Let's take a moment to hear what the church teaches about the end in the catechism, because I think it helps contextualize these types of passages and prophecies. <clears throat> 
following the catechism, before Christ's second coming, the church must pass through a final trial that will shake the faith of many believers. The persecution that accompanies her pilgrimage on earth will unveil the mystery of iniquity in the form of a religious deception offering men an apparent solution to their problems at the price of apostasy from the truth. The supreme religious deception is that of the Antichrist, a pseudo-messianism by which man glorifies himself in place of God and of his Messiah come in the flesh. The Antichrist's deception already begins to take shape in the world every time the claim is made to realize within history that messianic hope which can only be realized beyond history through the eschatological judgment. That was some crazy verbiage, but the meaning is pretty clear. Whenever somebody makes a promise that they can solve all of our earthly problems and woes through earthly means, that is in anticipation of the message of the Antichrist. The church has rejected even modified forms of this falsification of the kingdom to come under the name of millenarianism, especially the intrinsically perverse political form of a secular messianism. In other words, don't count on politicians or nations to save us. The church will enter the glory of the kingdom only through this final Passover when she will follow her Lord in his death and resurrection. The kingdom will be fulfilled then not by a historic triumph of the church through a progressive ascendancy, but only by God's victory over the final unleashing of evil which will cause his bride to come down from heaven. God's triumph over the revolt of evil will take the form of the last judgment after the final cosmic upheaval of this passing world. So at some point, the world's going to end. We don't know when. We don't really know how. But what we do know is that it will be accompanied by an attitude of radical non-dependence on God. The ultimate end of things, in many ways, seems built into the very structure of the cosmos as we understand it through science. Our sun will one day, five billion years from now, according to astrophysicists, burn itself out, become a red giant, inflame, explode, collapse down, burning up the earth with it. The universe itself eventually will flame out into an endless, vast wasteland of entropy. We are not meant for this world to be our eternal home. And Jesus assures us that it isn't. That the seeds of destruction planted in creation ultimately will experience fulfillment in the creation of a new heaven and a new earth. In the meantime, what of the church? In Mark chapter 9, uh, verses 9 and 10, coming down from the mountain after the transfiguration, they're told not to speak of the transfiguration until Jesus has risen from the dead. We're reading about it in the Gospel of Mark. Obviously, they got around to it to proclaiming it. And that proclamation was at the heart of the mission of the church. Pope Benedict XVI observed that the death of Jesus on the cross followed by his resurrection is in fact the ultimate mustard seed. From this seemingly tiny event, so much has blossomed. The church then will remain proclaiming the kingdom until Jesus returns. Recall again from the book of Daniel 
the, the Son of Man coming on the clouds, his kingdom will never be destroyed. The Catholic Church has persisted for 2,000 years. And it's kind of a miracle to behold, especially when you survey history. The Catholic Church has not been preserved through the infinite wisdom of its leaders, rather in spite of that. The Catholic Church has been preserved because God has willed it so that we, Catholic Christians, can be a witness to the death and resurrection of Christ. Here's an interesting historical tidbit. Napoleon, in his conquest of Europe, conquered Rome and took as prisoner Pope Pius VI. Being the good French revolutionary that Napoleon was, he no longer addressed him as Pius VI. Instead, he called him Citizen Brosky. Brosky having been his original surname. And he died in Napoleon's custody. And when he died, his gravestone said, Citizen Brosky, exercising the profession of pontiff. And at that point, a lot of people thought this was it for the Catholic Church. Napoleon has conquered Europe. How on earth are they going to elect another one? It took them a while. The cardinals met in secret. And quite some time after the death of Pius VI, they in fact elected Pius VII. Pius VII lived long enough to see the end of Napoleon. But in that moment in time, in earthly terms, it was not apparent that that would ever be the outcome. And the only reason it was the outcome is because Jesus Christ willed that the church would nurture within her bosom the kingdom of God until his return. And here we are, carrying that forward to this day. A couple of reflection questions. First, what examples come to mind of a secular power behaving unjustly, but ultimately facing judgment itself? Second, what implications do these examples have for how we, as believing Christians, should interact with secular powers? Contemplate those for the next four minutes or so, and at a couple minutes after eight, I'll begin the third and final talk for the evening. <laughs> 